So we'll wait for Sony. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming we're going to do this after Sony. So we'll just wait for Sony and then you know, do the song today. Yeah. Hi, Sony. Hello, hi, Bilani. How are you doing? Whoa. <laughs> How are you? I'm great. How are you? Good, good. How is everyone? Good. <laughs> Sony, I was going to make uh, some introductory remarks, and then I'll turn it over to you. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Welcome, everyone, to the 2023-2024 Lucille Cobb Memorial Lecture here at Doan. This event is funded annually by an endowment in memory of Dr. Cobb, who was a professor of English at Doan from 1959 to 1969. The series is intended to broaden public awareness of the art of thoughtful writing by talented authors and scholars. Uh, I also want to thank my wonderful English colleagues at Doan, uh, Phil Weidel, Brad Johnson, uh, for their gracious assistance in making this special evening a reality, which includes the pizza and drinks. Um, adding on to that, uh, thank you for the administrators who've shown up today, Lori Cook Benjamin, Dean Pizza Maligo. Uh, we have the president, uh, Roger Hughes and Lori Hughes here. Uh, a former faculty member as well, Ellen Holler of the English department, and of course the students. I understand that today is homecoming kickoff, so I really appreciate everyone who came as well. The Cobb Memorial Lecture Series has had many venerable names attached to it, and I'm excited to add poet, translator, and as of now, the executive director of Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures, Sony Toname, to that list. Uh, so for those of you who might not know me, I'm Melanie Ritzenthaler. I'm an assistant professor of practice in the English department. This is my second year at Doan. I had the pleasure of first meeting Sony last year in the summer of 2022 when I worked with him at the Chautauqua Institution in Chautauqua, New York, in his role as the director of literary arts there. If you are not aware, Chautauqua is a nonprofit that brings tens of thousands of visitors of all ages to their summer assemblies and has done so since the 1800s. It is touted as being America's oldest continuous reading entity. Chautauqua is dedicated to the ethos of lifelong learning, and those visitors can expect to be educated and enriched by the variety of speakers and performers they bring in, writers, humanitarians, scholars and scientists, political playmakers and ministers, performances and plays of all kinds, all often applicable to the week's at-large theme, such as what is the future of human rights? How do we reconnect with the natural world and what do we gain? How will we record this time in history and what does that tell us about the future of storytelling? In a bit of happy happenstance, there is a tie to Crete, Nebraska in this too. In the 1880s, the Chautauqua movement allowed this caravan of ideas to spread across America. And at that time, Crete, Nebraska had the largest such assembly in the country, congregating in Tuxedo Park. For me at Chautauqua in 2022, this oftentimes interdisciplinary experience was as informative as it was energizing. And Sony was at the center of this. For Sony, writing, reading, literature encapsulate more than just his roles as poet and executive director, which is to say that it would be doing Sony a disservice to suggest his work is just that, work. Sony's life's work has in many ways been about sharing the gift of writing with others. This has drawn in readers of all ages, from working with children at schools and youth serving institutions, to the lifelong learners of Chautauqua, to the work he's done with ID13, an online journal that originated in publishing the works of inmates at the Lake Erie Correctional Center, where he led poetry workshops. 
In thinking about the power of literature and writing, I think Sony has shown that accessibility, community, and the conversations that can stem from that are where the meaningful work happens. Sony's enthusiasm for this is unparalleled and incredibly inspiring to see in practice. And bringing Sony to Down, I hope his experiences and wisdom can act as a North Star of sorts as to how our liberal arts education makes passionate, lifelong learners of us across <laughs> and through disciplines to encouraging the communication, collaboration, creativity, and vulnerability that Sony so often shows and how that is not just a feature of our time at Down, but the intended design. Sony Totome is a Haitian poet, essayist, and translator. He has been the Michael I. Rudell Director of Literary Arts at Chautauqua Institution since 2020, stepping down as of yesterday, I believe. In addition to his chat book, The Woman, which was published in 2019 from Ironworks Press, he is the author of the Haitian Creole translation of the book, Olympic Hero, The Lennox Kilgore Story, he is also working with Haitian scholars and putting together a Haitian Creole course in Duolingo. His works have appeared or are forthcoming in the Idaho Review, Poets.org, Hunger Mountain Review, and the Cleveland Review of Books, amongst others. Sony received his MFA in Creative Writing and Poetry and a bachelor's degree in Business Administration from Kent State University. He will begin his tenure as the Executive Director of Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures next week in October. Following Sony's remarks, we'll have time for questions from the audience. Everyone, it is my honor and privilege to introduce Sony Tonami. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone uh, really for this invitation. It is such an honor and a privilege to be here with you, uh, although uh, through the ether of the internet. Uh, but I'm very, I feel very lucky to be in conversation with you. And I say it's conversation because I do have uh, something prepared that I will share, but I am very much looking forward to talking with you and to having a Q&A where we can exchange ideas and we can talk more. Uh, that without further ado, really thank you, the staff of uh, Duan University and Melanie for this invitation. I am very much honored to be here. I will be talking uh, with you mostly as my capacity of an art administrator. As um, I said, I am uh, really officially now the executive director of Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures. And before that, I was the Michael Iwudel Director of Literary Arts at Chautauqua Constitution. Uh, I've been working a lot on when it comes to uh, art administration and as what I see as really uh, providing the platform for writers and readers to come together. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, share my prepared remark and then uh, we can go to the Q&A. Uh, after that. The Cobb Lecture Series intention, uh, as it was uh, shared with me, is to broaden public awareness of the art of thoughtful writing by talented authors and scholars. I have to admit that I am not a talented author or scholar, as my mom reminds me all the time, uh, but I do know some talented authors who are making thoughtful art. And in my position, I am privileged enough to provide them with a platform. I will spend the next couple of minutes talking about the process and why I believe it is an important one. But first, how did I come to this position? I was born and raised in Haiti. As a timid child, I spent too much time reading. And as a middle child, to get my siblings' attention, I would tell stories from the books that I read. This is all to say that I was not the most fun person. I feel safe to tell you that because I know you two were no different. We live for stories. We make sense of this world through them. This is our strength. Right. In high school, I was the editor of the school magazine, Tufu Tuflam. Uh, 
it's difficult to translate in uh in English, but I believe it's all fire and all smoke. Right. It was one of the most precarious and uh, precocious and formative experience of my art administration career. I'm grateful that very early on, I got to witness emerging writers and being humbled by them who were way smarter than I was and who saw the world and understood the world in different ways. I was constantly amazed and in awe by my peers' writings. Every trimester, I would long to publish their works and encourage the students to read them. In a way, I had become the uh, uh, I'd become the writing cheerleader in chief. Right then, I came to the U.S. for college. I could not speak English then, so I did what was at the time the sensible thing. I studied accounting. Let me say this uh, clearly. This was a bad idea. Not that you do not need to be proficient in English to major in, in English. I am proof of that. But also studying accounting won't spare you from English. For English, that the major that is, is the platform, the mother of all majors. I should make it clear now that studying accounting in itself is not a bad idea. We need good accountants. It was only a bad idea in my case. I was studying something out of fear, thus limiting my options and stifling my creativity. And I do not wish that on anyone. During my senior year, my accounting classes completed I took a poetry workshop with Mage Regan, who ended up being my major, my mentor for the following four years before his passing. I mentioned Major because of his profound influence on me as a poet, a teacher, and a community member. It was in his classroom that I first discovered a community within the university where I could not find myself as an international student who did not particularly enjoy his major. Mage fostered an environment where teaching poetry was tangential. The main focus was always the people sitting next to us in class. That was the poetry not the words we were clumsily putting together on the page. Teaching poetry was a mean to stay open to life's challenges and make space for others, to witness the beauty and learn from their attempts. My best friend to this day is someone that I met in that class. Just last week, nine years later, those of us who were still alive Life came together on the campus of Kent State for a dedication for Midge. And when we were talking, we realized how, diff how our different paths were shaped by his workshop. So my first poetry workshop in the United States taught me to appreciate writing and its importance and community building. So I say this with no levity. This life of writing that we have chosen is what keeps our society alive. We are all called to make sense of this world through our art. Our stories, poems, and essays will comfort people through difficult times and will inform policies for this country and the world. Now is the good time to ask another question. Why do this work, broadening awareness to the arts, especially, especially literary arts? In short, I will answer because stories are powerful. We are living the stories those who came before us have told or written. This is very much true. It was Said and his essay, Zionism from the standpoint of its victims, 
explain how the writings of the British writers of the 19th century especially had made the occupation of Palestine possible. The Swedish, the late Swedish uh, writer Sven Lenquist in his book, A History of Bombing, showed how writers like Jules Verne and their depiction of Africa in particular as a barren and savage place assuaged the Europeans guilt when Italy dropped the first bomb ever on Tunisia and then in Ethiopia. The same way Americans came to accept and live with the first with the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and more recently in the Middle East. M. A. Cesar in his famous essay Discourse on Colonialism argued that the Holocaust could not happen without the stories that Europeans told themselves about the others during colonial times. And for our own time, this late stage capitalism we are living through was written and model, molded in South America by the light of the Chicago, Chicago boys. And of course, the good things we enjoy today have also been made possible by the vision of writers of the past. The progress of human rights, the environmental stewardship, the advancement in technology, all can be traced to stories of the past as well. Books like The Jungle by Upton Sinclair and Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe, despite all the flaws, change and continue to change the world. Last summer, I invited the science fiction writer Kemp Stanley Robinson to Chautauqua for a lecture around his novel, The Ministry for the Future. And I told him that the novel will be essential if we were to face and survive climate change. And I truly believe it. It's a novel I believe that everyone should read, although it's science fiction, but it's peculiar and essential. And finally, what exactly do I do? as an art administrator? Well, I see my job as creating space for writers and readers to meet, to facilitate dialogues and encourage reading. To do that, I identify good writers to bring to my organization and engage them in conversation on the topics I judge important for the community. I do this with care and vigilance. I listen, and get the buy-in of as many community members as possible. I can talk more about that, about the selection process during the Q&A, but it's a little bit complicated in itself, right? This part of my job focuses mostly on up and coming or established writers. The established writers afford name recognition and a sense of familiarity to our community. Our audience knows about the writings and can fairly predict what they will bring to the discussion. The emerging writers, while they do not offer or they do not attract big crowds, offer the most exciting aspect of my job. They bring new ways of seeing and understanding the world. The conversation they incite are surprising and at times more fulfilling and engaging to our audience. Doing this would be enough to satisfy my job description. However, my own philosophy convinces me that it is not enough. The best writers are yet to be discovered, and unfortunately, some of them will never be. They won't be because they are not the right places. They are not at your college right now. They are not in the big cities or in the residency cohorts. Some of them are failing high school at this moment. Some of them are in prison cells, in a nursing home, a hospital, and some house and in some houses preparing lunch for their five-year-olds. I want to take this moment now to talk about two outreach programs that I've led in the past couple of years. The first one was in 2017 and 2018 uh, in a medium security 
prison in Conyard, Ohio. Uh, with a uh, professor from Kentet, Christopher Dom, uh, who had a grant to open a book club in a prison. I tagged along with drive and we'll go to the prison and we will read books for the book club but they will afford me they will give me 30 minutes during the two hours we'll spend together to workshop a poem and while i was there working with the inmates i saw them starting writing poems and most of the poems were very much letters to the people from the, from the outside. They were writing poems to their daughters, some of them very confessional po po poems. Those were not written at the first uh, meetings. It took a uh, couple of meetings for them to feel comfortable enough to uh, open up and to trust us and trust their, uh, uh, the other inmates. And they were signing their poems with the number that were, with the numbers that were assigned to them. So uh, I did not know a lot of their names, but I had to memorize those numbers. They were long numbers uh, to have an idea to know who, what, what. Uh, so I kept working with them and by maybe the end of a year, in a year, really, they had enough poems to make a chapbook. Uh, I talked with them and I said that I would like to make a chapbook. And we were thinking about a name for the chapbook. Uh, we thought really hard uh, about names. And then the idea of having a number was uh, very much present uh, to us. And we wanted to have a number. And that's where the number I did 13 came up. The reason 13 is for the 13 amendments. Uh, the 13 amendments which uh, abolish slavery in the United States, except if you've been convicted for a crime. So uh, slavery can still happen within the prison uh, uh, walls in the United States. So that's where the names uh, come from. But the thing that I uh, witnessed was the idea of hope and, and the idea of taking something and make it, uh, takes nothing really, make something out of it. The, the, the fact that they were signing their poems with their numbers, right? It's, it's both uh, very sad, but at the same time, very inspiring that this number, they had reduced them to, had made something worthwhile. And a lot of the inmates, uh, former inmates now, who are out are still uh, in touch. And although I move on since I left Ohio, they are still having poetry reading in different cities in Ohio. And they are still publishing chapbooks from uh, folks who were, are still in prison and those who are out now. And I saw people making sense of their lives through poems and taking responsibility uh, uh, for their actions, but also um, indicting the world that we live in. Open my eyes and new ways to see uh, things. The second uh, example is an ongoing, hopefully, uh, well, hopefully I will be able to continue it, uh, not as uh, much as I used to since I was living here. It was an ongoing project of going to Jamestown High School. Uh, and Jamestown, if you do not know Jamestown, is a very depressed uh, city, uh, a city that is not too different from the Wasp Bell. Uh, was very prominent with manufacturing during the uh, mid 20th century and now uh, is struggling. We do finally have some great news with uh, a 
a surge of immigrant people coming to the uh, city. Uh, you, you can see this a city on, on the rise now. And so I will go to the high school and I will workshop poetry with the kids. And as you can tell, I'm not too cool. Uh, I'm wearing a shirt without a tie and it's buttoned up. So I'm not the coolest person. And for high schoolers, that don't don't even think about it. So to work with them was always a challenge and to bring poetry to them, to ask them to write poetry was even worse, right? So I would attempt to find them where they are and I will uh, try to get them to write something. And one December, I was how they poetry, poems with them. And one of them in particular, which was very, a, a very difficult uh, to get him to write. Uh, I was talking about the countryside during the holidays, right? Uh, what we do in the countryside. And luckily he was the expert on that because he, is, he was from the countryside and he lived on a farm so he decided that he was going to write the best poem because he could uh, talk authentically about the subject. And he wrote uh, that poem. And after uh, finish writing it, he uh, showed it to me and he said, this is such a good poem. I'm going to translate it into Spanish uh, so my parents uh, could understand it. And that was enough for me. Uh, but also I saw someone was very reticent to the arts, finally finding his voice and then taking ownership to something that he's built. There's two example, really, examples of why it is important to go to places and to find those writers. So some of the writers were yet to be, right, do not know their writers yet. And most of them only need one person to tell them or give them the tools to drive their first piece, right? That's all they need. This is what I believe is my calling. And I hope for the students here, it is also the same uh, for you. To be the person to encourage or offer the tools to someone to find the writer and themselves. Just as it was for you some years ago when the English teacher, and I'm pretty sure now, right, wrote in your essay that you had something special and you should keep writing. I want to know that I speak only of writing because I'm a writer, but I suspect that this applies to all forms of arts. Some of us will become exceptional writers. Some will become art administrators. Some will become editors. Some will, of course, become accountants and masons. And my only hope is that wherever you end up, you remember these words, the future is our writing. It is no small or futile thing. And because of its importance, we ought to bring it to as many and various voices as possible. Thus, we need to find them from every corner or nook of society. The best way to do that is to make writing as accessible as possible. And you need to bring it to the community, no matter where. Thank you for your time. And now I would like to answer some of your questions and hear your ideas about writing and the community as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Johnny. Thank you so much. Um, I have a few questions myself, uh, but to put it out to the audience, uh, if anyone had a question, um, I can repeat it for them so Sonny can hear it. Uh, anyone want to get us started on? Brett. I have to start with this. Um, 
he Sony referred to English as the mother of all majors. <laughs> so uh, if, if he could maybe explain a little bit more what he means by that, be correct. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. I heard I had question. Thank you. Yes, I do. I truly believe. I truly believe it. Uh, uh, and as someone who studied accounting, I think I'm a good judge of that. So the the, the reason I I say that is because uh, having a degree in uh, the humanities, but especially English, is really i believe what the university setting was uh, made for right uh almost everything else right is uh preparing you for career but english very much is preparing you for life and is preparing you to um be efficient to everything right so when you study english the uh, tools that you get, right, through readings, through creative thinking, right, and creative reading will be able to serve you and everything, right? You are attentive to details, which is paramount to uh, an accountant, right, uh, a doctor, whoever it is. You are also uh, great on working with people, right? So uh, when you go to the real world uh, uh, you will be working with people and an English major will allow you to be able to sustain to keep a conversation but also to anticipate people's uh, emotions and to um, broaden your horizon to see where people are coming from right the stories you're you're reading and the discussions that you're having are um, bringing the world to you to that. Whereas if you study something that is more uh, specific, you ended up working in a very specific thing. Like I, as an accountant, I was, I was uh, trained in a gap uh, uh, tradition of accounting that is mostly used uh, in English speaking world and the Western world, right? When I went back to Haiti and work as an accountant, I was lost, right? Because they use uh, a different system than GAP and accounting. That does not lessen the importance of uh, uh, major, but it required for me to dig deep into my uh, uh, critical thinking skills that I learn in my uh, curricul uh, uh, colloquial classes and uh, English classes to understand the similarities of uh, uh, between the gap and the uh, uh, ARP, uh, system that is used, especially in the French speaking and some European countries. Right. So uh, that's why I say that. But um, there are other reasons why English really is that, because when you're studying, we're studying English, you're, you're a philosopher, you're, you're a philosopher, you're a sociologist, right? You're an accountant to all the stories, different stories and different books and discussions that you're having. You're touching on all of the other majors. And so that's that's why I, I say that. Uh, and also, all of the great people I've worked with, they all studied, uh, they all had a uh, humanities background, so. Yeah. Hang on, Sam. Okay, sorry, we're freezing here for a second. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, uh, so I had a question for you, which is that you touched on your work um, with working, I think, with youths and Jamestown High School, and you also talked about your work with inmates. Um, I was really interested if maybe you could talk uh, in terms of art administration uh, at Chautauqua or, or at uh, Pittsburgh Art and Lectures. Um, I think sometimes the thinking is after I've finished college, I have no more to learn. 
uh, but institutions like that are all about lifelong learning. Um, so what do you think we gain uh, from your work from arts administration and maybe this focus on never stopping learning? Yes, yes, uh, it is. It is so important uh, for uh, you and, and by you, I mean like students, right? Once you're done with your major to find a community of uh, lifelong learners, right? That will sustain you. Uh, a lot of, I, I read something very depressing. I believe on average, the uh, people uh, after college read one book. Uh, in the lifetime after college, right? Although although you're reading a lot of books, so you're keeping that uh, percentage uh, to one, right? A lot of people do not uh, go and read books after that, and they become very isolated in their own field, right? And they become an expert in their own field, but uh, they are not open to uh, all their ideas. Uh, with communities like Chautauqua, what it offers is really to bring people to have conversation about uh, different things, but also to uh, keep challenging us, right? There are, I, I am very lucky because I receive books from uh, publishers and uh, also from community members who give me books uh, to read and to, to select from those. I get to uh, with a lot of books, but a lot of things that are happening in the world right now are in those books. And if you do not uh, stay uh, really in the community that will keep encouraging you to uh, read, to um, uh, stay abreast of what is happening, you're going to be so busy with life right, with your responsibilities that you are not going to stay really abreast to what is happening. Another thing as well is, uh, and I believe uh, Chautauqua, the thing that I want people to remember about is me uh, doing my best to provide a platform pe for people to have that I go about doing, I went about doing that was to bring books. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Bring books that uh, would challenge people, but at the same time will be a point on comment between people. Right. So for example, uh, I, I was, I was lucky to select 10 books this summer for people to read and bring the authors there. There were books that were very, very intense, right? Uh, very political and very partis uh, partisan uh, and, and, and the subject matters, right? There were books that I disagreed with, right? But I wanted to have conversation with people and I, people wanted to uh, have conversation about those books. I, I brought those authors too. And there were books. One of them was a book, a novel about nothing, right? Uh, and people people read it and they told me that I should not uh, choose that book, but they all read it and they all could not stop talking about it, right? So it, it, the reason uh, it is important to have this variety of uh, thing is for us to be able to go from American Midnight which really chronicles a very difficult time in America, America's history, right? To discuss that and be uncomfortable with that and have even strong arguments around it, right? And then move to a book about nothing, right? Or to a book about a uh, family in the countryside, uh, people can relate to, right? Or a a, fam a book uh, from a uh, perspective of a young boy traveling in the United States, right? So you are able to have something in common, right? Every time you go beyond the reasonable uh, reasonable conversation or argument, you can always come back and say like, well, 
at least we both uh, didn't like Dr. No, right? <laughs> Uh, that Dr. Law is a is a wonderful book. It's I chose that <laughs> I, I chose it because I love the author and I love the book. Uh, but a lot of people find that this is a book about nothing. Why am I learning? And but some people say like this is the best uh, argument for feminism because it was a parody of James Bond, and uh, his argument was only a robot can play that uh, a Bond girl. Right. And a lot of women were coming to me. It's like, this is this. Yeah, I, I I see this. And a lot of men were saying, like, this is a book about nothing. Why do we have to that? But the thing is, they all read the same book. Right. And that is something they can uh, come back to. And, and that's why it is important to have communities and to have uh, um, faith and being able to be vulnerable in the community during those conversations, right? Where so uh and that you that does not mean it should only be Shitakwa or it can it, it should only be a lecture series. It can be a group of friends that you have, right? But you keep writing uh with uh, you and reading as the center of that. Hi, Sonny. Thank you. Hello. I want to shut off our camera and so we can still see you, uh, but that might help with the freezing. Little Wonderful. Low little low tech trick I learned from a science colleague. We'll see if it works. Sonny, was that Dr. Nobed Percival Everett? Was what you said, the book about nothing. Yes, I, I, uh, he's he's my he's my favorite author. I spent the last three years in this position trying to get him, and I finally got him. So, yeah. But if you have not if you have not read Percival Everett's work, you should go right now and read one of his uh, thirty novels. Uh, he is a master he's one of the best writers writing right now and he's there's a movie called american fiction that is coming out uh i believe in it we will be in theater in december uh based on his novel erasure so if you want to start somewhere uh you can start reading erasure now or you can go see the movie american fiction uh there are some oscar balls around it it's uh he was very uh, proud of the movie. So there's a way to go in to be introduced to Ev uh, Percival Everett if you haven't. That's great. Thanks. Um, I know you can't see us, so just narrating this. Uh, does anyone have a question they want to put for Sony at this point? Can you read it? Yeah. All right. So we're going to have a student question, Sony. I'm going to read it up loud to you. All right. This is from Christelle. How do you balance your various roles as a writer, translator, and educator? Are there specific projects you are currently focused on more than the other ones? I'm muted. Yes, thank you so much for uh, this question. I uh, it's a difficult it's a difficult one as of right now, like this past summer. Uh, I could not write at all because my season and uh you can tell right like, the season is a 24 hour and nine weeks non-stop madness right so i could not write at all but uh i i made it uh at the end of the season i said that i was going to finish this manuscript uh that i'm work I, i've been working on since maybe 2020. And I was able to be at the moment where I said like, okay, I have all of the poems now. It's done. I just need to revise it. And I am very happy that uh, this manuscript is ready. It's done. Uh, now I can go and revision. But uh, the next project that I, I will focus on and I will try to get done is a, a translation project. I am translating the work of Maurice Sisto, who was uh, the most famous 
uh, l'audience and, and Haiti. Uh, so l'audience is a, a form of literature. It's an oral tradition in Haiti. It's, uh, he did not write his stories. He uh, recorded them, right, he, uh, in cassettes. And that's that. Uh, every Sunday I would listen to those audience, and I'm translating those into uh, English now. I be, two of them uh, were accepted last spring uh, in two different magazines, and they will be out soon. But I still have at least six more to translate. Uh, hopefully, that is going to be a collection. Uh, a, a small collection of uh, audience short stories. I, I'm planning on finishing those probably in the spring as I'm moving to another uh, a, a, a job now, right? I, that in the spring will be the best time for me to focus on them. I should finish that. And then after that, I will probably start working on uh, some essays and short stories hopefully so it's all to say that i do things and block uh, i try to focus on something and then i focus mostly on my job all right because my job has the priority in that way um uh, but when it comes to projects i do stay on the project and try to uh write as much as i can it's a very difficult thing to balance because in between in between project, I will be a pool from another thing. For example, one of the reasons that I uh, could not finish the po uh, poetry manuscript was I was spent I spent two years working on this Duolingo uh, Haitian Creole class that they pulled me out of it, and I had to give all of my attention um, beside work to that. So that's that's I. Although I have put those plan in, one thing that I'm very uh, interested in right now is to help with the immigration, uh, especially the Haitians coming here and who have to go to court and need someone to translate for them. I am in touch with a lawyer in New York City and seeing how I can help uh, remotely through Zoom to translate for people who are seeking asylum or seeking to move here. So those things will pull me away from the project, but I do try to give all my time to project one at a time. I don't know if that answers the question. No, I think you definitely answered the question. Thank you, Sunny. Um, other questions from the audience? Yeah, Sarah. Um, what kind of things do you say or what kind of advice would you give to students or people that you work with that are maybe struggling to find their writing voice? Yes. Uh one the 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 the, the advice that I always give them is first to uh trust uh yourself, but also to stay open, right? to stay open because we have so uh, much coming at us at all time, right? That what we uh, sometime call our voice might be an amalgam of everything that's coming at us, right? It might be uh, the way that uh, the new fashion is, right? It might be the language of the new social media, right? That, uh, uh, that is in vogue right now, right? The way that the people you uh, uh, admire uh, speak and you are uh, emitting uh, them without knowing it, right? And it, you think it's the authentic voice. It At times it is, uh, but sometimes it is not. But you need to be confident that you are on the path, right, to find that real voice. And it might be what you have right now. And the confidence only helps you to keep writing, right, and to keep at it. Uh, I always tell people that I am going to be the Morgan Freeman of poetry 
Uh, no one will know about my poetry until I'm gray, and then I will be like Morgan Freeman. Uh, it, it, and I, I say that because I want to be patient and give grace, uh, like extend grace to myself, right? Because when I look back at some of the things that I was writing last year, I cringe a little bit, right? So I feel like I'm still finding my voice. But this voice that I have here, although it, it might not be the authentic voice, then we do not even know what that means anyway, an authentic voice, right? Is possible because I had allowed myself to live with that voice that I had uh, that was uh, uh, precocious and unfound a year ago, right? So what I want to say was that like two white and two do not uh, be afraid to make mistakes, right? Stay open to this world, uh, take in as much as you can, and then on that you will find your voice. And if you do, don't, don't give up uh, because it's not commercial, right? Or because it's not in vogue. Do not give up your uh, idiosyncrasies, your eccentricities, right, are the things that will differentiate you from a writer. If you're doing something that everyone else is doing, be question, uh, question it. If, if you see everyone is doing something and you're doing it, even if you're doing it well, question it, right? Because uh, the world that we have right now needs new ways of seeing. And if you are not bringing that 50 years from now, it might be difficult for people to be reading you. Thank you. Thanks. I think that's building on your comments about vulnerability and, and openness from earlier as well. Uh, we had another question from the audience. So this is Carter, your question. Um, how do you think growing up in Haiti and then coming to a different country has affected your journey, uh, both your own career and your writing, potentially? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for this question. It, it, it was a blessing, right? Because uh, when I was growing up in Haiti, I knew a way of life. And I was very much uh, in the majority. Right. And, and uh, the fact that I was in the majority, I thought that uh, I was the center of uh, of life. Right. And every uh, my story was the uh, the norm. Right. Uh, and then I came here and had to, uh, a rude awakening to like, oh, no. Right. The world we live uh, things differently. Uh, and uh, my place in the world is very, very much limited, right? That that gives me another uh, uh, way of seeing life. But it's also a curse because now I feel like I'm not adequate uh, of, a, uh, uh, of being Haitian and ex obviously of being an American as well. I am not even an American, right? So you feel like now you're not... Uh, uh, adequate on anything and that is for me is a good thing because I have to question myself all the time and as a writer even though you have to be confident in the way you have to question uh, yourself right you have to see uh, things in new ways so you are going to make mistake right talking about mistake one thing that uh, come in here made possible for me was to alleviate my shyness, my my timidity. I was quite shy when I was in Haiti, but now I'm not that shy anymore. Right? I I uh I can speak with people now. I, I do not shake anymore when I speak with people. And that was made possible because I came here and I could not speak English, right? And I was volunteering uh at a, a, a the church where I was attending, I was volunteering in the fishbowl where the children, would, the, the parents would drop the children, right? So those three-year-olds will just correct my English and they will they will say that I speak funny, right? So, and and that was liberating because I was like, here, these kids, 
still telling me that I'm not good enough, right? And why should I uh, be embarrassed, right? And that is not my first language anyway. So this kind of take away the shame and take away the uh, ego that came with the uh, certainty of being in the majority in Haiti, right? And knowing the languages that you speak in Haiti, right? So I, and also it gives me more uh, stories as well to tell. Uh, I I am now looking back uh, in Haiti, I can morph stories and bring new perspective to them, right? So it, it, it is definitely a plus. It is definitely a plus, although it came with its baggages as well, because when I came here, it was, uh, very disorienting and now every time i go back to haiti i am a stranger right uh, to to my family and to my friends in haiti because i speak funny and also i do not know any uh songs after 2010 which is which is the worst thing that can happen to you if uh, as a Asian to go back to haiti and keep singing song from the 19 1990s so it's all to say that I'm glad that uh, I got those two perspectives. I'm sorry that happened to you, Sam. Um, <laughs> I know it's the it's it's the worst thing. <laughs> uh, we have a question from President Roger Hughes. You had mentioned an English major transcends all majors. The media and politicians are devaluing majors in the liberal arts and humanities. How do you answer these critics? of studying the liberal arts or the importance of the liberal arts? Yeah, yeah, that is that is something that I'm fighting against, right? Like my, uh, it's it's really, my alma mater is building a giant uh, uh, new school for the uh, uh, business building. And then the, the, the English department is a little bit neglected, right? Uh, but I understand that, I understand that as well because you know, uh, my accounting friends are definitely giving more money to uh, the university than I am, uh, which makes sense. But I find it uh, a sad thing because uh, what I'm seeing now is we are following the market instead of leading. Right. What I mean by that is we are uh, forming uh, people, citizens, to be workers, right? which is very important. It is very, very important because without work, we cannot uh, keep our society together. But another thing that is important as well is thinkers. We need thinkers. Uh, all societies, right? All great societies have produced amazing thinkers, right? And that is the thing. It, they do not, big, great societies did not only form on the back of workers, but also on the back of people who think for the future, who will think for uh, ways for workers to enjoy themselves, like, right? For example, what is happening right now uh, with uh, the writers in Hollywood, right? We need the writers because after a day of work, we need to be able to watch a movie to uh, uh, lose ourselves in a, in a little bit, right? And if we do not have that, life will not be enjoyable, right? And workers will not be satisfied and productivity will decrease, right? So it is no little thing that writers, uh, what we do writers is right, what, what the philosophers do, all of those things are important. And in a way, uh, it, it, it is asking of us to provide places and income 
to uh, those thinkers, right? To do the work they do because it's very important. And that's how I say as my work to invite writers to pay them and to give them a space where they can write, they can think, right? And the university can do that as well. But to sh to for us to prove that what we do is worthwhile, we need to be uh, open about it, about the importance of it, right? And I don't think that is something that we've been doing well uh, in the humanities because of fear, right? The courts, we have to produce, we have to keep producing and we have to keep publishing, right? Uh, and we have to make sure that we have enough students attending uh, our lectures, all that. But I think what we do best uh, is not something that you can quantify. And so it is difficult uh, to prove to a politician that we should invest in the humanities. The thing, the thing that we can do is to tell stories of the alternative, of a world where the humanities is normal, right? Of a world where uh, uh, our students are not learning about uh, Aristotle, right? Homer, about Toni Morrison, right? Uh, uh, wh wh whoever we can think of, right? The, this world is a world that you do not want to live in. I am horrified every time that I will go on certain uh social media uh site right it's I think it's it's one letter of the alphabet now it used to be called another name to see the way the discourse there right the way people are talking and how they are not aware of anything that has been discussed us in the past 100 years, right? They will be so uh, open and confident and pure ignorance, right? And those people are very successful people, right? People who have invented uh, the big apps, who have uh, made millions of dollars, but they do not have the understanding of the, the fellow people around them or how this will work, because they never made it to an English class. They never uh, take the time to struggle with an essay that was written really to explain, uh, try to explain the past, right? And if we can do that, if we can bring those concrete examples who are writing to show this alternative and to show the connection between uh, the decadence that we're seeing in our society with the decline of funding for the humanities, I think we can make a good case for ourselves. But if our case is only going to be based on productivity, on how many students are in our classrooms and how many scholarships that we publish, we are not going to be able to compete with uh, a business person who can give a million dollars or $10 million to, uh, an, to start an endowment. We are not going to be able to win this if we are chasing uh, uh, neoliberalism uh, with the market because our work is not really for the market. It is to sustain society. And uh, it sounds arrogant in a way, but it is true. Uh, it is the thing that will get us to imagine another future. And without it, we are going to build towers of the towers, right? We are going to amass a lot of money and we are all going to build beautiful coffins for all of us. So uh, my advice is really to make clear what we are for and what we are for is not really to chase the market. It is to build um, better people and better society. Yeah. That was amazing. Um, on, a, on a lighter note, uh, I think we're wrapping up Q&A here. Uh, 
Here's a question from Lucas. Uh, can you speak to a few Haitian artists or Haitian American artists that can be a good portal for Americans to understand Haitian culture? This question is from a late 30s professor who grew up idolizing white class and the Fuji. 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 and learned about Haiti through hip hop. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so uh, there, are, there are a lot of amazing Haitian writers, but uh, the, uh, one that comes to mind right now is Edwidge Dantica. I don't know if you know Edwidge Dantica. Uh, his writing, her writing uh, uh, is amazing and mostly centered on Haiti as an Amer uh, uh, Haitian American writer. Uh, the another person who is translated uh, into English who is uh, alive now is uh, Jean d'Amérique, uh, and he is a poet and a uh, novelist. He's been translated uh, in English now. Um, ho yeah, hopefully you will. Hopefully you will read some of the audiences by Maurice Sisto when they are published. Uh, I I think Maurice Sisto was the most important voice in the Haitian literature for the past 100 years, right? Uh, because he really explained the society very well. And uh, as someone who was uh, living uh, under dictatorship, uh, under Duvalier, and still be able to write in a way that uh, question uh, the way of lives and that uh, under this uh, uh, dictatorship is very, very uh, interesting. Past, past writers, if you can find a book by Jacques Stephen Alexis, uh, Jacques Stephen Alexis, he, he was a novelist uh, killed by Duvalier. Uh, and but before his uh, untimely death, uh, he wrote some really great novels, and some of them is Romance aux Etoiles, uh, Compe uh, General Soleil, which is uh, Compare General Son. Uh, yeah, Jacques Stephen Alexis and poets read uh, Franck Etienne. So there are a lot of there are a lot of great writers writing right now. Uh, and 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 I make a, there is a writer, there is a writer from someone, someone I haven't read it yet, but someone told me he is American, but he spent a lot of time in Haiti. Uh, uh he he has a trilo uh uh trilogy of uh of Haitian uh, novels uh, on Haiti. It's his, da -da -da -da, his name is Madison Smart Bell. It's the Haiti trilogy series. Uh, I am in touch with him. I'm talking with, with him. And he is, I haven't read the books yet. The books are three books, The Stone and the Builder Refuse. The, the Stone that the Builder Refuse. All Souls Rising and Master of the Crosswoods, those three books. Uh, he he is a very interesting writer, and as as a, an American writing about the Haitian Revolution, uh, I've I have a lot of respect for him. So I will I would advise you to read it. And I and I and I for my conversation, although I haven't read them yet, but for my conversation with him, he is very knowledgeable in their history. That's great, Sonny. Thank you. Um, I'm going to put out kind of the last call. Uh, does anyone have a last question for Sonny before we go? All right. I think I'm going to turn the camera back on so you can actually see us as we say goodbye, Sonny. Thank you so much. Hey, I can see you all. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your questions and thank you for being here. This was a fabulous time. I really appreciate your time. That's appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> All right. So thank you again.
Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone. And it was such a pleasure to be with you. And hopefully, I hope to see you in person uh, in the future. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye. Yes.